go ahead and uh, take your seats and continue. Okay, so so continue, just continuing on the on the overview of the uh, uh, of the the topics the course will cover. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, so yeah, continuing on the on the course overview. Uh, after after we we've talked about uh, these uh, basic concepts like uh, like encryption and and personally identifying information and things like that, we'll uh, we'll start covering more topics about how they fit together in uh, say in a network network wide con uh, context, uh, looking at uh, net network and operational security practices, how to. Uh, um, so these are, uh, uh, you know, considerations, especially that sy system administrators, uh, you know, need to consider. It's uh, it's their job. You know, it, it might be your job if you uh, end up being a sy system administrator. Um, but even if you don't, even if you're managing data in other uh, uh, for other reasons, it's important to to know some of these uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, concepts. Uh, how to identify. Uh, different classes of risks, how to minimize them, um, uh, update information, um, uh, evaluate, uh, you know, what, uh, um, uh, <coughs> what information is valuable and more and, or, and less sensitive, um, and, how, you know, how to minimize risks using techniques like compartmentalization, dividing, you know, making sure that even if an attacker gets this pot of gold, hopefully they won't get that, uh, get the others too. Um, various network level protections and and uh, and backups and other techniques. So, um, and preparing and planning for uh, responses for for if and when something does get breached. Um, so, unfortunately, you know, in this space, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Operational security and network security story has gotten so dismal that uh, you know some companies are just you know many companies are increasingly assuming they will get breached and taking provisions like uh, like stockpiling Bitcoin just in case they need to pay off uh, the next ransomware. But uh, yes, you. Had it. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll try. <laughs> so I don't. This isn't a microphone, unfortunately. So, okay, can you hear me in the back now? <laughs> okay, good. So, um, so you know, we're seeing this practice of uh, uh, of you know stockpiling Bitcoin just to pay off uh, potential cyber criminals. Of course, this is not you know kind of uh, a real sustainable solution in many ways, right? Um, and uh, uh, and you know it, and it often doesn't uh, you know for many many types of attackers it's not actually going to be effective at all especially if the attacker is interested more in information rather than uh, rather than just making money um, as would be the case for for example the Swiss uh, Ruag uh, attacker the attacker that that uh, uh, got access to this uh, Swiss defense contractor for. Uh, for a number of months in 2016, before finally being uh, being detected, right? Um, and so, because of the, these severe severe problems, uh, difficulties with uh, operational security and, and network security, it's becoming more and more important to use techniques like compartmentalization, you know, dividing networks and secrets and you know data into different zones. Uh, that uh, and and ensuring that each zone has uh, you know uh, the the fewest users and other systems that uh, you know can minimizing the amount amount of users and other systems that have access to that zone or the the data in it um, uh, to to uh, uh, try to minimize the damage if if any one zone gets compromised in some way, okay. Um, 
So uh, continuing from operational security, we'll, we'll look into, into some uh, security, uh, information security and privacy policy issues. So this is where we'll get uh, a little bit more into, the, into for example, the, the GDPR, like I mentioned. And, um, uh, uh, you know, what, what are the laws uh, that pertain to the handling of information and how are those laws evolving and, you know, what's it going to mean in the future. Um, but, uh, but not just laws, but also, also practices such as best practice, practices, uh, standards uh, that, that companies already use or the way those practices are evolving. Um, and then we'll, we'll touch a little bit on uh, continuing questions of controversy such as, uh, such as um, uh, the, the conflict between individual privacy versus the, uh, the interests of law enforcement, for example. You know, if you, uh, so the, uh, um, there, there was a, uh, a big case um, uh, uh, um, recently where, you know, the FBI in the U.S. was trying to get Apple to create a special version of their iOS to allow them to decrypt a, uh, the, the cell phone of a, uh, of a uh, terrorist suspect. Um, and, um, um, you know, that, that brought, uh, uh, you know, created a, a huge debate and, and created some very, uh, you know, creates uh, some very tricky issues um, uh, in terms of uh, considering the risks, uh, you know, the, to individual privacy versus the uh, 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 versus the uh, desire of governments to, to be able to get data that can help them, them track criminals, track uh, money launderers, and things like that. Um, and of course, you know, many of these policies vary quite a bit from, across, from country to country and uh, ac across the world, and they're especially different between, uh, between the Euro Europe and the U.S., for example, in, in many important ways. Um, so, okay, so uh, then we'll, uh, we'll get more, uh, like I mentioned earlier, into focusing on the data itself. So, you know, what can we do to the data that we want to protect as opposed to the way we're storing it or trans transmitting it? Um, and often we want to, uh, to, you know, have a data set that initially might contain personally identifying information but we'd, we would really like to scrub it uh, of that personally identifying information so we can still use the data uh, as for, for research studies, for example, uh, without, without risking the, the privacy or the anonymity of the, the users in it. And so this is super, you know, a super common important concept for you know, medical studies. Medical researchers need to get data set on a lot of different people who have, who have taken treatments in, in hospitals and compare them and try, try to figure out, well, uh, you know, kind of uh, across, uh, across many people, across multiple hospitals, what can we infer about uh, the relationships between, you know, these diseases or these genomic uh, uh, properties and, and, you know, responses to, uh, to treatments and things like that. Um, and so often, we, uh, you know, we'd like to use and release data for very scientifically relevant and important uh, purposes, but unfortunately, you know, it turns out that a lot of these anonymization techniques, for example, you know, doing the obvious thing of just cutting out the, uh, you know, the name and phone number or turning them into, uh, turning them into random numbers, doesn't quite work, um, as we've seen, um, uh, in, in a number of very uh, uh, well-known attacks where it was shown that, you know, given this anonymized data set in which, in which the names have been, names and, you know, addresses and stuff have been removed, well, uh, if you get, find some other data set that does have names and addresses and, and only a tiny bit of overlapping information, such as zip code, or, you know, uh, uh, general uh, uh, location, birth date, and gender, um, and you know you process these data sets in the right way, you might be able to you know, reconstruct, um, you know, correlate the more sensitive information on on here with 
uh, with you know the the very personally identifying information over there to basically de-anonymize the data set, right? And so we'll look into how some of those anonymization attacks uh, work and what we can potentially do to protect against them. Um, so we'll get a little into how um, you know machine learning and how it uh, how uh, uh, how uh, um, the the security and privacy um, issues that machine learning uh, brings up. For example, so you know machine learning is increasingly used everywhere. Um, how many of you are or you know will or have taken the machine learning course? Yeah, yeah basically yeah, everyone. Yeah, that's that's what I thought. Uh, <laughs> Everybody wants, you know, is interested in machine learning for good reason. It's it's a very powerful, important uh, uh, technique, but it also very much has its dark sides, right? You know, there's always uh, um, every powerful force has a dark side, and machine learning is definitely no exception. Um, and and it comes in different forms. So. Machine learning uh, algorithms, when they're you know depending on the data they're trained on and the way they're used, they can uh, not only do what you expect, but they can do things you don't expect, like preserving biases or you know, you know kind of um, unfair uh, uh, kind of um, you know make unfair or biased decisions based on the biases that might have been embedded subtly in the, uh, in the data sets it was, uh, it was trained on, right? Um, but then there are also very interesting and clever attacks specifically on machine learning uh, algorithms and tech, uh, techniques, um, such as, uh, uh, and this is an area we call adversarial machine learning, so researchers have demonstrated that you can do things like, uh, you know, take a picture of a panda that your machine learning algorithm is perfectly confident, you know, it's fairly confident, yeah, that's a panda, and then you add just the right amount of subtle noise to it uh, that still leaves the picture looking to a human exactly like it's a panda, but now the machine lear learning algorithm says 99% certainty, definitely a given, right? And there, you know, there, and this is actually kind of an old example. There, there's uh, uh, even more amazing ones recently, and these are basically hacks against the machine, adversarial hacks against machine learning algorithms themselves, and they can be used potentially for much more serious uh, consequences than just d distinguishing between pandas and gibbons. Um, so. Not uh, a little while ago, yeah, like in 2006, um, uh, do any of you remember the Tay? Uh, I think I think I think we've got the machine learning algorithm that doesn't like my lecture. Yeah. Okay, uh, I don't know. It may, yeah, may, maybe a Tay has come back to life and is after me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in 2006, Microsoft released a an experimental ch machine learning based chatbot that just tried to uh, tried to answer you know answer answer piece, people's questions, and uh, but it would lear also learn from people and try to you know learn to be a more responsive, interesting you know kind of uh, more try to engage people and you know kind of. Um, uh, and, and so it was a very closed loop, uh, you know, learning system, and somehow, but somehow, very quickly, the uh, um, you know elements, uh, uh, you know, the kind of the troll uh, uh, trolling elements of the internet uh, figured out how to basically hat the chat, a chat box to turn it into a you know fascist. Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, fascist, racist, a really hateful, you know, virtual figure, and uh, and so you know, Microsoft had to take it down almost immediately. It, it, it did not last long, and as far as I know, it hasn't hasn't gone up again, unless uh, uh, anybody uh, remembers something uh, it coming back. So anyway, uh, machine learning is a fun and interesting topic, especially from a security and privacy perspective. Um, so we will cover um, some uh, advanced privacy, uh, privacy topics, techniques, uh, so, so 
uh, going beyond the basic uh, crypt uh, as, you know, standard cryptographic primitives I mentioned that we'll cover in an early lecture. There's much more advanced uh, approaches to cryptography and distributed systems uh, techniques that in principle uh, uh, can be used to, to do lots of processing on encrypted data of different kinds. And, and some of these, uh, so, uh, so, you know, for certain types of processing, you can keep the data encrypted and allow servers to actually, uh, you know, uh, perform transformations, perform computations on that data while leaving it encrypted so the servers, you know, can't actually see what's going on, can't violate the privacy. Um, and so this is, you know, very interesting, potentially powerful technology. Again, the details are for a crypto course, not, not in this course. We're, we're only going to kind of scratch the surface and try to make you aware of kind of what's out there and what's, what's emerging in this space. Of course, this tends to be still very inefficient, uh, uh, you know, technology as well. So it's not, you know, widely used like you pay you know, a million times the, the, the cost in, uh, uh, in computing or, uh, power, computing time or energy and, you know, things like that. Uh, so you have to use it carefully and only uh, in, for, for things where, where, say, privacy matters most, say, sir, for the most sensitive types of information. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I, you know, heard some of you have, uh, have heard of Bitcoin and stuff, uh, so, uh, you know, blockchains, uh, so this created the whole uh, blockchain, um, uh, you know, bandwagon, let's call it, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which is very interesting as a, as a phenomenon, uh, you know, Bitcoin as a technology is very interesting, and the whole, you know, kind of Bitcoin, uh, blockchain and smart contract, uh, uh, thing that it uh, that it spawned is also very interesting in a number of ways. Um, you know, we won't get deep deeply into it, but uh, we'll uh, um, we'll look into it a little bit in part because um, at the heart of you know the, the 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 central idea of a blockchain basically gets down to the uh, to a very old, much older uh, concepts in computer science, such as uh, consistency. Uh, and uh, consensus, and especially Byzantine consensus, the property of being able to, uh, to build a system in which multiple nodes can agree on a value or a ledger state or, you know, or actions in such a way that, you know, if, a, uh, if a, some threshold, uh, uh, if, you know, below some threshold of those nodes are misbehaved in the, you know, most uh, malicious, uh, or you know, arbitrarily bad ways, the system as a whole still functions correctly, as long as not too many of the nodes are are malicious and colluding with each other, right? And so, um, you know, this concept of Byzantine consensus, uh, you know, that's at the heart of the of blockchain and, and Bitcoin. This, this was a, around long before, but. Uh, at least from my perspective, I think an important thing that Bitcoin did, besides you know creating all this interesting you know uh, speculative bubbles and stuff like that, uh, um, uh, is uh, is it kind of brought the news to the rest of the world outside of computer science that it's possible to build Byzantine fault tolerant systems. It's possible to build big distributed systems that are that. Uh, don't fail and can't be hacked unless a threshold, not just one, but a significant threshold of participants is, you know, compromised altogether. Um, and this is a very powerful and important uh, tool in general for, for security. And so it's important to understand uh, the basics of that. And so, um, uh, so we'll, look, we'll look at, you know, blockchains and smart contracts uh, in, that, in that context. Um, so I haven't talked about uh, much about uh, smart contracts in particular. So, so smart contracts are basically programs embedded in a in a blockchain. Uh, you know, that kind of execute on the blockchain. Well, they don't really execute. You know, on the blockchain since the blockchain is just an abstraction. But what they're doing is executing in a replicated fashion across many different nodes that are checking each other's uh, execution and results. Ethereum is the most uh, uh, you know, well-known application of this, and um, 
and it's you know it's a very you know in, uh, in principle a very cool powerful concept that you can kind of just upload a program along with a small pot of gold or a big pot of gold or ethereum let's you know uh, and the program determines what that's used for and the program can in interact with other con contracts other users it can uh, uh, and it can ma implement many many different types of uh, uh, things like auctions and bets and you know uh, uh, implement uh, you know virtual investment organizations decentralized autonomous organizations but um, how many of you uh, followed the Dow incident uh, back in uh, a while ago. Okay, so the decentralized autonomous organization on Ethereum that uh, that you know wanted to be a virtual on blockchain investment house that anybody could kind of buy into and invest money in, um, and then vote on well what what ventures, what entrepreneurial ventures you wanted to support and things like that. Um, only and you know a lot of people were excited about it and it, it uh, accumulated what 120 million dollars uh, uh, something like that in worth of ethereum and then a, an attacker found an exploit in the code but uh, but because the code was on the blockchain and it was already fixed you know nobody had no individual party had control of it it was just kind of had its own life and you know, it was hacked, and so this attacker basically drained what you know half of the uh, the uh, uh, amount of the, the you know like 60 million or something, but and the price crashed uh, uh, before they managed to halt it. And then the Ethereum, the the community just decided to you know change the blockchain to hard fork the blockchain, basically change the rules just to you know kind of fix this hack and give back the money. Right. So super interesting you know, risks that, uh, uh, security privacy risks that, the, that this notion of smart contracts can create uh, in addition to, uh, you know, the promise and, and potential power they can provide. Okay. So, um, kind of uh, getting, delving further into some somewhat deeper topics, we'll, um, we'll explore side channel attacks. Now, this is a large class of attacks um, that uh, uh, where, where an attacker targets uh, information sources that you wouldn't expect are there, right? Um, so uh, uh, a lot of devices either uh, physically, you know, emanate electromagnetic radiation in unintended ways as well as the ways that are intended. And, uh, and you know, there are often many ways to uh, you know, if a you know attacker is sufficiently clever and has the right equipment, they can kind of figure out those emanations and possibly use it to figure out, ah, you're running the AES encryption algorithm, and if I watch closely and and use a sufficiently powerful um, uh, you know statistical uh, uh, analysis and listen for a while, I can recover your your private key uh, and and uh, you know crack the encryption, right? Um, and, uh, and also software does this. So, so this has been an increasingly common um, source of vulnerabilities in, in software systems where, where um, you know, as a, uh, an encryption algorithm or some, some other algorithm that operates on sensitive data takes a little bit longer you know, to execute if it sees a private, a secret one bit and a little shorter amount of time if it sees a secret zero bit or something, just, you know, kind of super basic example. And there's some way for an attacker to observe how long this particular segment of execution took and thereby, you know, indirectly derive, you know, whether that sensitive bit was a zero or a one, right? And, um, and so, um, so this is this is really you know kind of getting really into the some of the nitty gritty um, uh, you know kind of low level hacking techniques. We won't we won't get deep into this again. This is just a uh, you know high level summary to make you aware some of the things that are going going on. But it's it's important in general to understand the unintended the many many unintended channels through which information can totally accidentally propagate. You know, nobody expected that, you know, you should be able to 
extract sensitive information from you know, this device or from this software package or this virtual machine on the cloud. Um, you know, there were no uh, you know, particular bugs that anybody knew about. In the, you know, the code was apparently working just fine, but just the way it behaved created this unintended emanation. So, um, and in fact, this just recently, um, one of the biggest, most important um, incidents of, of you know, side channel attacks uh, um, or side channel vulnerabilities were just recently discovered a few, uh, uh, a few months, ab months ago, which, which affect uh, practically all Intel processors and many other processors, uh, uh, and they're, they're fairly fundamental to, to the hardware. So we'll, we'll look into some of those side, side channel attacks. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the overview of the uh, uh, of the overall content of the course. Just to give you a feel for uh, for what we'll cover. Um, any of the, that's basically it for now. Uh, any questions for, before we uh, break early? And of course. Uh, You'll, you'll have many questions, I'm sure, about the exercises, but you'll learn a lot. Uh, you'll, you'll learn more about the exercises on Friday. I hope you can make it then. Other questions about the, the course? Or feel free to come, back, come down and ask me after. Okay, thanks a lot. So see you next week.